We know that good writing is timeless, but this is ridiculous. Week after week, James Thurber keeps offering us warnings from his time about our time. For my money, this is another of his classic, perfect recollections of his youth in Columbus, Ohio. The story is true. Thurber would have been 18 on the March day this all happened, or in this case, didn't all happen. It appeared first in My Life and Hard Times in 1933. As usual, I'm reading from the Library of America, Thurber Writings and Drawings, edited by Garrison Keeler, recently reprinted because you asked for it. And so did all those who ran first and thought about it second in The Day the Dam Broke by James Thurber. My memories of what my family and I went through during the 1913 flood in Ohio, I would gladly forget. And yet neither the hardships we endured nor the turmoil and confusion we experienced can alter my feeling toward my native state and city. I am having a fine time now and wish Columbus were here. But if anyone ever wished a city was in hell, it was during that frightful and perilous afternoon in 1913 when the dam broke. Or to be more exact, when everybody in town thought the dam broke. We were both ennobled and demoralized by the experience. Grandfather especially rose to magnificent heights, which can never lose their splendor for me, even though his reactions to the flood were based upon a profound misconception, namely that Nathan Bedford Forrest's cavalry was the menace we were called upon to face. The only possible means of escape for us was to flee the house, a step which Grandfather sternly forbade, brandishing his old army saber in his hand. Let the sons of come! He roared. Meanwhile, hundreds of people were streaming by our house in wild panic, screaming, go east, go east. We had to stun grandfather with the ironing board. Impeded as we were by the inert form of the old gentleman, he was taller than six feet and weighed almost 170 pounds. We were passed in the first half mile by practically everybody else in the city. Had grandfather not come to, at the corner of Parsons Avenue and Town Street, we would unquestionably have been overtaken and engulfed by the roaring waters. That is, if there had been any roaring waters. Later, when the panic had died down and people had gone rather sheepishly back to their homes and their offices, minimizing the distances they had run and offering various reasons for running, city engineers pointed out that even if the dam had broken, the water level would not have risen more than two additional inches in the west side. The west side was, at the time of the dam scare, under 30 feet of water as indeed were all Ohio River towns during the great spring floods of 20 years ago. The east side, where we lived and where all the running occurred, had never been in any danger at all. Only a rise of some 95 feet could have caused the floodwaters to flow over High Street, the thoroughfare that divided the east side of town from the west and engulfed the east side. The fact that we were all as safe as kittens under a cook stove did not, however, assuage in the least the fine despair and the grotesque desperation which seized upon the residents of the east side when the cry spread like a grass fire that the dam had given way. Some of the most dignified, staid, cynical, and clear-thinking men in town abandoned their wives, stenographers, homes, and offices and ran east. There are few alarms in the world more terrifying than the dam has broken. There are few persons capable of stopping to reason when that clarion cry strikes upon their ears, even persons who live in towns no nearer than 500 miles to a dam. The Columbus, Ohio broken dam rumor began, as I recall, at about noon on March 12, 1913. High Street, the main canyon of trade, was loud with the placid hum of business and the buzzing of placid businessmen, arguing, computing, wheedling, offering, refusing, compromising. Darius Cunningway, one of the foremost corporation lawyers in the Middle West, was telling the Public Utilities Commission in the language of Julius Caesar that they might as well try to move the northern stars to move him. Other men were making their little boasts and their little gestures. Suddenly, somebody began to run. It may be that he had simply remembered all of a sudden an engagement to meet his wife, for which he was now frightfully late. Whatever it was, he ran east on Broad Street, probably toward the Maramore restaurant, a favorite place for a man to meet his wife. Somebody else began to run, perhaps a newsboy in high spirits. Another man, a portly gentleman of affairs, broke into a trot. Inside of 10 minutes, everybody on high street, from the Union Depot to the courthouse, was running. A loud mumble gradually crystallized into the dread word, damn, the dam has broke. The fear was put into words by a little old lady in an electric, or by a traffic cop, or by a small boy. Nobody knows who. 
nor does it now really matter. 2,000 people were abruptly in full flight. Go east, was the cry that arose. East, away from the river. East, to safety. Go east, go east, go east. That is where time requires us to stop for the first part of our story, remembering always that the dam did not break. Part one of the day, the dam broke by James Thurber.